Warm hello to everyone and many thanks for giving me uh, an opportunity to give this presentation on indoor air quality in the educational environment. I added a subtitle, we can do much better, which will be my conclusion. Well, uh, if I ask you what affects indoor air quality, I'm sure everyone would come up with a list of all kinds of possible sources and factors. So to organize it somehow, I put these few boxes uh, attributing different sources to different classes. So in particular, sources we operate or introduce conditions we create for biological agents, and this is in particular mold, we as a source, and this will be a source of carbon dioxide and particles containing pathogens, and pollution that comes from outside. And on the top of this are factors, many different factors. For example, how we operate the building or meteorological factors which uh, affect what comes inside. So this is the whole complexity of the what affects indoor air quality. If we just uh, give some examples of this, of course, we won't be able to explore all these sources. So starting with um, indoor air sources at schools, this was a study which we conducted several years ago. And the idea was that uh, at the time, the government was interested what would be the impact of air quality in that particular schools after introducing a bus lane in the proximity to the school. So we were asked to um, help do some monitoring and then model uh, predicted um, concentrations of pollutants uh, with the busway. So we started the monitoring and on the very first two days of monitoring, this is what came up. This is time series of particle number concentrations, otherwise called ultrafine particles, which are a very important uh, pollutant emitted by any combustion sources, in particular uh, vehicles. So this is the monitoring and as, we can see, as you can see, uh, uh, on each of these two days, just after nine o'clock, concentrations of ultrafine particles in the classrooms um, started increasing and increasing to extremely high level. These are very, very high levels. The question was, what was causing this? We searched through the entire school and we didn't find any what we would expect combustion sources and we couldn't tell what the reason was. The government, uh, who was part of the investigation, asked where should the school be closed if there's some unidentified source which is so strong in the school. I wasn't game to suggest closing the school. Several months later, the study was repeated. By, by that stage, we have a uh, hypothesis what was the problem. The problem was formation of particles in the classrooms from the products emitted by what the kids were using in, in the art classes. So art classes in the schools are now whole, uh, like a whole uh, chemistry labs with all kinds of potential emission sources, in particular of volatile organic compounds. So this was the hypothesis, the emission of these volatile uh, organic compounds was resulting in formation of these particles, very high concentrations. Well, another aspect which I mentioned in this classification is the uh, impact of outdoor pollution on indoor air. Here is um, a, a little study we conducted again uh, several years ago to look at the links between indoor and outdoor air, and that was specifically for PM 2.5 and PM 10, mass concentration of particles smaller than 2.5 and 10 micrometers, and particle number concentration, which is mainly ultrafine particles, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago. Now, we looked um, at studies published uh, around the world for the situations at home, schools, and office. Now, what we found out that each, in each of these environments, the situation was different in terms of the sources, but in schools in particular, we found out that the source of PM2.5 and PM10, which are mainly larger particles, was inside, 
while the smaller particles were coming mainly from outside. Now, inside the source of these particles, as studies reported, were in particular dust, sand, and so on, brought by um, uh, the kids or the, uh, or the um, students inside. Now, particle number concentration was increased because of the outdoor combustion sources, in particular vehicles in the proximity to the school. And as you can see, the situation was different in, deep in, in the other, uh, between the other environments. Another study uh, which we conducted, it was looking specifically at the volatile organic compounds uh, outdoors in the proximity to schools that were schools in Brisbane and indoor. Outdoors, we found out that, uh, as expected, that uh, vehicle emissions, petrol vehicle emissions, fewer evaporation, to some extent industrial emissions were the main, the main source. However, indoor, uh, cleaning products, air fresheners, art and cl uh, art, uh, class activities, and contribution to a small extent from other sources, in particular outdoor sources. So we found out that indoor VOC concentrations, um, concentrations were higher than outdoor and generally comparable with what was reported elsewhere. So again, the contribution of indoor and its importance. Now, these uh, examples were uh, sources, anthropogenic sources indoors and outdoors. However, in the concept um, uh, context of the pandemic, the very important aspect is what we uh, people introduce into the indoor environment and in particular pathogens. And in the context of this, we've heard many times uh, ventilation open the, open the window. One of the recent advice from the World Health Organization provided in this pictorial way is exactly this. Good ventilation protects you from COVID-19 infection and that good ventilation according to this poster is open the window as is presented in each of these panels. So uh, let's uh, concentrate for a moment on, on this um, opening the windows, which means natural ventilation which is very common type of ventilation in, uh, in this kind of environments and in particular schools. Most schools in uh, Australia in different states are naturally ventilated. When it is not too cold, not too hot, not too noisy, not too polluted and safe, the window or windows are open. However, the reality is that in most climates, no, most places, and most of the time, there is some kind of a problem. Too cold, too hot, too noisy. Windows are closed, which means there's no ventilation. So um, basically, we can equate natural ventilation on many situations to no ventilation. As I said, like in this um, a fairy tale for, uh, for, for kids, the king is naked. There's no ventilation with a little disclaimer that by no ventilation, I mean minimal ventilation, because there's always some leakage of the air uh, into um, inside the buildings. Can natural ventilation mean ventilation? Well, um, this was discussed uh, in this uh, Danish study where they did analysis of what would happen in terms of infection risk. If, now in this case, infected person was um, leaving the uh, environment of the classroom, and this was classroom, for some period of time, which means the whole classroom would leave the class for ventilation. And we could see that if the infected person, which means the whole class uh, classroom, was inside, uh, was there, so the concentration of, of particles containing uh, the pathogens would remain would stay, uh, remain stable. However, if occasionally the class the students would leave, then the concentration would uh, uh, go to very low levels. So, in principle, it can if it is well conducted. However, in the reality, how many schools or Department of Education will want to flexibly change school schedules? In my experience, is that very few, which means there is no ventilation. But one point here, what do we mean by natural ventilation? Well, it's another word uh, or term for this, airing, which is opening windows to let air in and out. 
The problem with this or problems is that, first of all, this may not provide sufficient ventilation if we uh, cannot open sufficiently the window or if there's not enough windows. And the big problem is energy invested in heating or cooling the interior is lost. So really, when we talk about natural ventilation in the future, we should think about differently. We should think about a building which relies on its design and interaction with the local environment to provide ventilation. And part of this is that, um, well, first of all, this would be provision of sufficient ventilation, but very importantly, energy preserved by, will be preserved by heat exchange methods, which means we would not be use, uh, losing energy. But such systems do not exist currently in, in the schools. So let's stay with the topic of ventilation for a moment. So it's not only natural ventilation, but there are mechanical ventilation systems, and these are the systems which are typically used in office buildings. When we talk about ventilation, there are two characteristics which are of importance, uh, sufficient and effective. Sufficient means enough of it, and effective means everywhere in the space, and airflow not from person to person, and that's in relation to infection transmission. In this um, drawing, you can see that uh, on the top panel, there's definitely not enough ventilation because these particles emitted by this infected person are everywhere. The situation is a bit better in the lower panel, but still uh, there is a flow from person to person. Do we ever wonder if there's enough ventilation in the classroom or anywhere? This is, this is a question which I um, used to ask well before the pandemic, based on an example of a meeting which took place uh, in Germany in a research institute which I visited. So the meeting um, involved, uh, involved five people in a large room, appeared well ventilated, and on the wall, they had this display, CO2 meter, big CO2 meter, well visible from, uh, from a distance. At the beginning of the meeting, uh, the concentration was um, this, uh, just over 500 uh, parts per million, and the uh, smiley green face. I was watching this with big interest to see that one hour later towards the end of the meeting, the uh, level went, well, was not that far from 1000, which would be the red. Even so, as I said, it looked well ventilated. But very interestingly, what I found out then from my German colleagues was that these CO2 meters were at the time already used in German schools to um, tell uh, the students and the uh, staff and alert them to the problem with ventilation and that something needs to be done. Well, they seem to have been well ahead of what is now becoming more common uh, uh, during the pandemic. Ventilation is extremely important. This is a study conducted uh, in the Marche region of uh, Italy at the end of last year and the beginning of this year from September 21 to January 22. And um, it's a busy diagram showing a few things. First of all, incidence cases um, daily in this region. And we can see that this is how the cases were evolving uh, on the, the values are on the vertical scale, logarithmic scale. Now, we also have con uh, uh, concentrated uh, cases in classrooms. And there were over 10,000 classrooms without mechanical ventilation system. And 316 classrooms were equipped for the purpose of the study with mechanical ventilation system. So we can see absolute values of the cases uh, in both these types of classroom, of course, significantly fewer absolute values in the classrooms um, uh, with mechanical ventilation because there were fewer of them. But if we put this in terms of incidence proportion, 
per uh, 1,000 students. We can see that in this way of presentation, there were significantly fewer cases in the classrooms which had natural uh, mechanical ventilation. So this is the importance of ventilation. But there are unfortunately limits to ventilation in airborne transmission risk mitigation. In another study uh, which we did, we looked at the uh, role of ventilation uh, in a lowering risk of infection. And what we found out for, that for this most infectious uh, diseases, measles was at the time most in infectious, SARS-CoV-2 was in the second place, but this was the wild variant. If we looked at this uh, for Delta and Omicron, uh, uh, they um, overpassed measles. So what we found out that even for high ventilation rate of 14 liters per second, uh, this may not be enough to maintain event reproduction numbers below one, which means the uh, outbreak will, um, will develop. 14 liters per second, it's a high level of ventilation. WHO at the moment recommends 10 liters per second per person in uh, shared spaces. The fact that there is that uh, theoretical limit of what ventilation could do was presented by this study in 1991 by Ed Nardell. So this is not something which is unexpected, which is new. We knew that with some very infectious diseases, there will be a problem. Can we do something? Can we control the risk of infections by such pathogens? We do, and the solution for this is disinfecting the air, but in a way that no additional pollution is generated indoors. And the way to do it is by using germicidal UV air disinfection, which requires low energy, does not generate new pollutants, is silent, robust, low maintenance, low cost. Extending this technology, well-established technology to what's called far UV, just of a different wavelengths, um, 222 nanometers, which is safe with very low penetration into human tissue, really significantly uh, helps in controlling the risk of infection. So basically, we could be doing to the air what we already do to water. Every drop of water we drink from the tap is disinfected. Is this something new, revolutionary, we haven't heard before? Well, again, um, if we look at this image from a classroom from the 1930s in the US, where this technology was used and um, demonstrated how efficient it was in controlling infection of measles, and since then, they've been used in many environments. For example, now it is used in uh, commonly in South Africa, where tuberculosis is a problem. So it is there. It is just that we are not using this. And it is the social license which is needed for this. So the vision for the future, there will be no naturally ventilated spaces, in particular schools and educational environments that have no ventilation. Indoor air standards will prescribe concentration of indoor selected pollutants and be enforceable, which means monitoring in every indoor space. Right now, Australia does not have indoor air standards. Ventilation as part of heating, ventilation and air conditioning system will be an element in enforcement of indoor air quality standards. And finally, ventilation in shared spaces will be supplemented by GUV to control airborne infection risk. And this is of particular importance to educational environment where there's lots of people in one spa a space spending a lot of time together. So this is very complex where science, technology, and awareness um, all are mixed up with politics on the top of it, but we can do much better. Thank you very much for your attention.